I'm Linda Rosenman. I'm uh, on the board of the uh, of the Ryan Foundation um, and delighted to chair this uh, session or to introduce the session. Um, our first speaker is Jai Lawton. Jai is currently the team leader for startup and development at Indigenous Business Australia, a commercially focused organisation with a vision for our nation in which the first Australians are economically independent and an integral part of the, the economy. Jai has a Bachelor of Justice degree from the Faculty of Law at Queensland University of Technology. Um, highly engaged within the QUT community, he has served as a student ambassador, equity ambassador and um, Odjeru unit ambassador. He's also served as a mentor for students as part of QUT's Indigenous Mentor Experience Program. In 2012, Jai was awarded an Indigenous Cadetship with the Law and Justice Research Unit Research Department within Queensland's Department of Premier and Cabinet. In addition to his studies, um, in his spare time, I assume, Jai, uh, was also a youth worker at the Brisbane Youth Detention Centre at Wakehall. Jai will be talking about um, how current economic policy orthodoxy has contributed to inequality amongst Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander people. Our second speaker is Dr Jeff Edwards. Jeff is President of the Royal Society of Queensland, the state's senior scientific organisation. In 2016, he was appointed as a research associate of the TJ Ryan Foundation. Previously, Jeff had an extensive career infusing public service with a steadfast passion for ecological science. In addition to positions with park systems in Papua New Guinea and Victoria, he has also served as a local government councillor and shire president in the Dandenong Ranges of Victoria and as manager of the Queensland Department of Lands and Natural Resources. His current research interests include analysis of the preconditions of economic prosperity, grand projects or public institutions, the debilitating effects of free trade for national prosperity, growing complexity in society, the environmental limits to economic growth, and exploring the value of public interest and national interest as benchmarks in public affairs. And Jeff's address will be um, how we can move forward and create more equal jobs for the future. So we will have both addresses. Jai will speak first and then Jeff, um, and then we will have about 10, 15 minutes for questions. So if you don't mind jotting down your questions, um, particularly if they're uh, for Jai, because people can often get distracted when there are, are two speakers, um, then uh, we'll definitely have time for questions at the end of the uh, the session. So to start with, um, Jai Lawton. Uh, thank you very much for that um, introduction. Um, so before I start, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country where we meet today. Um, I acknowledge that this country here, as well as the country throughout this continent we now call Australia, has a rich and sophisticated history with knowledge, law and stories embodied in thousands of generations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture. I respectfully acknowledge our elders before us as the story holders of the past. I respectfully acknowledge our current elders as the story holders of the present. I respectfully acknowledge those that are emerging, peoples of more recent arrival and peoples of the QT community as we look to create the stories of tomorrow with careful consideration of the historical context of this country and the First Nations people at its forefront. I thank Dr Mary Crawf Crawford and members of the, the TJ Ryan Foundation and their respective teams that, um, and those that contributed to making this um, event happen. Just um, with my um, presentation, to what, just this one here, sorry. <clears throat> Sorry? Oh, I'll keep going anyway. So I'd just like to throw a few little disclaimers out there. Um, firstly, that I don't have the right responsibility or obligation to talk on behalf of all Aboriginal peoples. And the views I, I share are those of my own and not reflective of the current organisation or any other organisations I've worked for previously. 
I might also add that throughout this presentation, I will refer to the term white, and that is not reflective of skin colour, though the set of values and beliefs. And the last thing is that the conversations that we will have today are not intended for blame or fear, but just to understand the context, to understand that the part that we each play, and to understand the part that we can play moving forward. Sorry, brother. <coughs> Cheers, mate. So my genealogy. I'm a descendant of the Bidjara people in central Queensland, with also Scottish heritage of the Mackenzie clan in Scotland. I'm a previous graduate of QUT, and oh, we've already discussed all that, so I don't need to say that. Um, and so I currently work in, in the economic development space, which is, I suppose, in some ways, at the end of the di different end of the spectrum to the to the youth justice space. Um, so I think what, what, I, what I'll talk about today is I suppose more on a, a higher level of what's the, the orthodoxy of, of, this, of the foundations of this country and how does that then filter down to the orthodoxy of, of the policies that are made which then filters down to how, the, how that works on the ground and how that impacts Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on the ground and, and in the communities. Um, so firstly, I think it's important to provide context and understanding of what has occurred in history to get us to this current position. The first point I would like to make is that despite the vast majority of public opinion, particularly out there at the moment, that I tend to experience daily on, on Twitter and social media, which I shouldn't get that far into because it gets me wild at times, but anyway, <laughs> the First Nations people of this country had an, exist ex an existing economy and traded for tens of thousands of years. And that's within the 400 nations within the, within the country or the continent now we call Australia, but also with uh, internationally, and, and this is just a few, including the Portuguese and Indonesians and others that date back to pre-1600s. The second point I'd like to make is best to find in a quote from, I'll call him my uncle, but he, he won't like it, but that's from my uh, Associate Professor Gregory Phillips, who's a medical anthrop anthropologist from the Wanyi and Jaru people of northwest Queensland. He explains, science is one knowledge system which I, have trained, which I have trained in and I respect, yet it is limited. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have our own knowledge systems that have enabled not only the most sustainable societies, but flourishing societies for 60,000 years and are not mere mythology. Societies where everyone had a role and everyone was valued in that role. The second point, and so that, that first point, I suppose, talks a lot about the the, ortho the orthodoxy of, of how this country of 229 years was established and um, without much consideration to the 60,000 years odd that, took, that took place beforehand. So my second point is in relation to inequality. Though inequality in my mind is a deficit mindset, so I'll, I'll look at it from a different state of mind. Oh, sorry, I'll go back quickly. The, so the current, the current, this is the current economic policy orthodoxy. So we talked a little bit about the historical context and whose values and beliefs that's based on. And I think that cultural lens tool sort of, not, not tool, the cultural lens infograph sort of sums it up pretty well. We, we don't see the world as it is, but as we are. And then we often try to interpret that, interpret those um, cultural values and beliefs onto other, under other cultures, which is uh, pretty bang on to what happens with... Um, Indigenous policy that filters down to Indigenous people is that um, it is not often based on the values and beliefs of Indigenous people, with all good intentions aside. So the second point I make is in relation to inequality, as I discussed. Though inequality is a deficit mindset, so it's best summed up for mine in this infographic, equality. The infographic explains that equality is about sameness, Equality promotes fairness and justice by giving everyone the same things. That's Aussie values as a core, mate, isn't it? Everyone gets a fair go, don't they? Well, equality is only existing if everyone starts from the same place. When you look at the construct of the last 229 years of history in the colony of Australia, with specific reference to First Nations people of this country, we can quickly start to paint a picture that reflects everything but starting from the same place. Now, please note, I've only been given 15 minutes to explain this topic, as well as 229 years of history, and then look at ways forward, so just bear with me. 
When we explore the true history of this country, the factual history, that as a nation, that there's, there's often an unpronounced fear attached. We see genocide through sanctioned state massacres, forced removal of children, segregation through policies and acts. Those policies and acts actually in Australia, um, for those that don't know, inspired the concept of apartheid in South Africa, a great achievement for our country. Stolen generations, and the list goes on, and that's not even scratching the surface. The reality is, is that if we all lined up in a room at the front here from the same place and asked a series of questions in, a ra in relation to equality, the Aboriginal and Aboriginal women, in, uh, more significantly, would be at the back end of the room. The historical mistreatment of First Nations people of this country is still happening today, and we're still feeling the effects of past treatment, mistreatment, generations later. So to, to, to suggest that we are a country of fair go and have each a chance of equality is another one of our, con our country's, our nation's fabled myths. So in saying that, how do we achieve equality? So in my mind, we must first explore equity. Equity is based on the notion of fairness. Equity gives people access to the same opportunities, our differences, and history that can create barriers to participation. And essentially, that's just a political correct and very polite way of describing the mistreatment of Aboriginal people above. So we must first ensure, we must first ensure equity before we can enjoy equality. And how do we do that? Where Aboriginal people currently sit in the context of this country is best described in a story told to me, and I'll call him my uncle as well and he won't like it. I call it the dance floor analogy. My uncle tells me, growing up in the 60s in a time when he wasn't considered a citizen under the Australian democracy, he was in a band with his brothers, an all Aboriginal band. They would play at their local hall managed by the Shire Council on a weekly basis and all the white folk would dance on the dance floor to their music because it was, it was just that deadly. So he says. <laughs> Given a sign of the times in consideration of the apartheid scheme discussed earlier, that was a, that, that's, yeah, that's not relevant. The, the Aboriginal people were not allowed to dance on the dance floor. They had to stand on the side, away from the dance floor. So one day, Uncle had enough. He took the dance floor down to the river, set it up on a, on a, on a bit of concrete and started playing there. And, and all the Aboriginal people, the family, were all able to dance. Um, they, they were able to... Sorry, I've lost myself here. Could dance wherever they pleased, unnumbered by white rules and white values. After a few more weeks, the shy, the shy hall managers folded and allowed everyone to dance on the dance floor. They were, and they were obviously losing money and, and, and everything coming in. Not a, not a good economic decision. Um, although there were some terms and conditions. They were only allowed to dance on the dance floor when the hours of, of, of the band were, were playing. And that's a, that's a true story. So now the fundamental issues here is that Aboriginal people were always working on a basis where white terms of reference are always given always the basis for negotiations. The dance floor analogy is still as relevant today as it was back then. We are allowed to dance, and again I say this not out of the colour of skin but out of values and beliefs. We are allowed to dance with white people but only if they own the dance floor. It's still their space, their rules, their power, their control. Take the orthodoxy of policy for example. Whose dance floor are we operating? Whose rules? Whose power? Who's in control? Who decides the policy? who develops the policy, who enacts the policy, and wonder why there's inequality. If only policy was made in line with the values and beliefs of the people it was designed to serve and support. How radical. So the challenge ahead for us all is to question the ownership of the dance floor. From an Aboriginal perspective, breaking down what does not work for us and rebuilding what is ours. Working out a tenancy agreement that is based, I call it a tenancy agreement, that is based on ownership or shared ownership of the dance floor. That is our lives. Is that not a human right for policy to be based on our values and beliefs, our rules, our power, our control? When that ownership or shared ownership is established, we will see policy that is reflected based on our orthodoxy that is rich in equality. So I go back to my first point. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have our own knowledge systems that have enabled not only the most sustainable societies, but flourishing societies for 60,000 years, and is not mere mythology. And I... I've got five minutes, so I think I might tell a little story about that as well. Um, one, one auntie was telling me about, and, and that, that's often overlooked, to, to create a, a flourishing society um, is, no, is no easy feat. And I'm, 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 I question how flourishing our, our society is in today's, in today's world, in today's context. And my auntie often, often talks about the, uh, 
the House of Representatives and, and the debates that happen there, and she she talks about it in in the keeping in mind that she's got sixty thousand years of knowledge in her genealogy. She looks at at these people as if they were, and they're the leaders of our country, as if they were little kids chucking a tantrum in the corner of a supermarket, and that's the reality of the situation. And and um, that's the immaturity as a nation that we haven't yet grasped the uh, the benefits and impacts that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge can have on today's society. Um, so, a tangible example of the of 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 how societies, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander societies, were structured and how everyone had a role and was valued in that role. Um, a tangible example of that is the fact that gender inequality was an unheard concept in, in Aboriginal culture through the notion of men's and, bu- men's and women's business. So that's the notion that men were responsible for men's business and had no right or obligation or responsibility to influence how women should, should live their lives and likewise women to live men's lives. So that's, that's one example of how Aboriginal culture um, can potentially... Um, addressing many issues in today's society. So Aboriginal knowledge systems are not only key to addressing issues surrounding First Nations people of this country, inclusive of economic development, but for people of all cultures. It can assist in addressing issues of of gender inequality, climate change, and assist in developing flourishing societies for everyone. I want to leave you with a tangible example of the impact Aboriginal knowledge systems and cultural principles can have on in today's society. I share a story of one David Unipin, featured on our fifty dollar note, dubbed as the Aboriginal Leonardo da Vinci. Well known for many things, and that's another whole talk to, to, to discuss David, so I just want to talk about this one in particular. I want to share with you an extract from the Daily Herald in 1914, some 20 years before the helicopter was even thought of. He states, an aeroplane can be manufactured that can rise straight into the air from the ground by application of the boomerang principle. The boomerang is shaped to rise straight in the air according to the velocity with which it is propelled, and so can an aeroplane. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jai. Uh, as spokesperson for Queensland's non-government scientist, I'd have to uh, rise to Jai's challenge and say we acknowledge the original observers of this country. Uh, They may not have observed it uh, in accordance with peer-reviewed printed journals, but they are observers nevertheless and developed a a structured knowledge system, so we pay respects to that knowledge and their memory. I'm not here to talk as a... um, for the Royal Society today, because I want to make a a few jibes at economists and politicians. Um, So if, if... my presentation can be brought up. I'd like to draw attention to two um, themes that are central to the concept of accepting inequality. One is that money directed to wealthy will trickle down, and that I would call is um, uh, money directed to the wealthy is sufficient to create jobs. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about that today. That's been the theme already. Um, The second limb, related limb, is that only the private sector creates wealth. And that's the argument that it's necessary to uh, direct money to the private sector in order to create wealth. Now, Scott Morrison's been mentioned today, so I will give him a burst as well. Um, The government understands that a dollar in your hand means you're more likely to make it into two dollars, while a dollar in the government's hand is more likely to turn it into 50 cents. That was his first address to the press club. Um, Now, I'm not going to make this a partisan uh, lecture, but I think it's one side of politics more than the other that tends to make these statements that government can do nothing right and that any money that the government spends disappears into a black hole. It never reappears in the form of wages or economic activity. Part of this I'm going to build on Tim's comment just before lunch. Four malign effects of using GDP as a measure of economic activity. 
One is it's a flow account, so it has no recognition of debt or capital, the erosion of capital, whether it's human capital, which is forefront today, environmental capital, factories or any other form of capital. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, the other thing is it measures traded goods and services, uh, regardless of whether they're good or bad for uh, society's well-being. And thirdly, and particularly today, it considers the value created by government services as worthless. So it, it counts teachers who work in the private sector as adding value because uh, the services that their company sells can be traded, but not teachers who work in the government service. That's just a cost to the economy. Now, if there are any teachers or nurses or park rangers in the room who think that they labour and produce absolutely nothing of any value to the economy... Um, please see me afterwards because I'll need to change this. So I think um, we just can't underestimate... We, sorry. We, sh we can't overestimate the damage that this concept of economic activity is, that government is a cost and never produces anything of value. Um, and the final thing, which I won't dwell on today, is that uh, um, GDP celebrates growth, not sustainability. So an economy based on endless expansion uh, has a limited future, and that's the one that we have today. So we have to work out a method of economic activity and prosperity without physical expansion. OK, the way I'm going to do this is to just trace what I think are the preconditions for, let's say, a small business. And it could be a farm, or it could be a milk bar, or it could be a little factory yet. And I'm just going to quickly run through what are the preconditions for that to be prosperous. Now, uh, let's not get hung up on whether I've got a complete list or whatever. I'm going to just list a few of the preconditions and then run through uh, them one by one. Um, first of all, it needs input goods and uh, materials. So to do that, it needs uh, it'll be part of a supply chain and it depends on factories or farms. But then... It depends on the products of the earth in some form. It depends on the public institutions of land titles, registries and mineral allocation. Um, it depends on a water grid and it depends on electricity grid. And if you think that can be run by the private sector, well, again, come and talk to me afterwards because uh, the Royal Society and the Foundation are running a seminar on Friday to say that the national electricity market is such a shambles that we need to start again. You anyway, know, I won't get onto that. But... Um, Underneath the supply of goods and materials are some fundamentals. One of them is a healthy environment and a landscape, and the other are the, the public services that allocate the, um, those uh, resources equitably. OK, skills. Um, skills to convert the raw materials or whatever into product. So on-the-job training can be supplied by your firm, but you're depending on some education. Even if your workers were educated at a private school, uh, those private schools depend upon public institutions, standard setting, uh, subsidies, <coughs> excuse me, uh, com compelling attendance and so on. So even the private education system depends on a public education system. Next one, um, knowledge. All right, where does knowledge come from? There are commercial media. The internet has a lot of uh, private, what you'd call private knowledge, word of mouth, industry associations. But underpinning them is government extension, um, public media, libraries, research organisations, universities, CSIRO, ABC, public institutions are feeding knowledge into the bottom of society all the time, if we allow them to do so. A small business needs a distribution system, it needs trucks and transport, but they require roads, they need transport infrastructure, they need a postal service, and they need telecommunications infrastructure. <coughs> OK, we keep going, and I've listed there a number of public utilities, um, police, weights and measures, um, currency, prudential regulation, contract law. Even if Mary and I have a private disagreement... Uh, she can call the police if I dud her. So even behind every private contractor, every private contract, the, the state is acting to enforce good behaviour and equity in the society. So uh, let's 
uh, we hear government intervention as if uh, markets are not a creature of government. Markets are a creature of government. And even if you look at the traditional village, uh, the, the, the barter that was in the traditional village was under the control of the elders. Uh, the elders in traditional society, we have now have government and they underpin all civil contracts. So um, I don't know how we could run an advanced society, even a simple society, without these shared services. And finally, the last ingredient of the successful business is customers with discretionary income. And the, the uh, Industrial Revolution kicked off in England rather than the continent because political emancipation came earlier and the poor were able to enter the market for goods and services earlier than on the continent. And um, markets, of course, they will uh, strengthen inequality because by definition they give the goodies to the people with greater purchasing power or greater pricing power in the market. All right, so let's just uh, put some of those things together. Um, in addition to those local scale ingredients for a successful small business, we also have some broader or national or statewide scale. Some of them I'm going to express in the positive, some in the negative. Uh, the positive ones, that uh, there has to be some coordination between government business and the community. Um, if we don't have that, then we have investment being directed to wasteful purposes, such as private toll roads. Um, uh, don't, let, don't get me started on that. <laughs> uh, the Foundation has published on that subject quite eloquently. Um, if we leave these decisions to the market, market-led proposals, there's now the enthusiasm in Treasury, we'll see private sector companies advancing projects getting a suction hose into Treasury, regardless of any strategic planning or public interest evaluation. Um, we need um, <coughs> uh, government measures to distribute uh, wealth so that people share good fortune. We need uh, government to rein in corporate power and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and so on. OK, now let's have a look at a couple of... Um, preconditions in a negative sense. We need governments to prevent unfair trade and the most obvious and all-pervasive one now is free trade and free foreign investment with countries that have a totally different currency, totally different labour standards, totally different environmental standards. That's not a level playing field. Um, that is just uh, sucking the energy out of Australian business. Um, we need governments to... Um, direct economic capacity into the fields where it's most uh, relevant. Um, toll roads, cost, benefit cost, 1.3 to, to 1, maybe 1 to 1, some of them uh, less than 1 to 1. Scientific research, typically 10 to 1, and some of CSIRO's research, 200 to 1. Why would we invest money in toll roads if we can get 200 to 1 bang for buck through scientific research? Those decisions can only be made by governments. <clears throat> um, we've heard today about the uh, cost to the budget of uh, drug addiction, crime, prisons and so on. Uh, this is a, a dead weight on the economy and it's correlated with inequality and with diet, which again is correlated with poverty. So um, we heard earlier about productivity. Uh, just... Uh, uh, the mainstream view is that rising living, living standards depend on better productivity and that depends on uh, business productivity. So the alternative view is the best way to boost productivity is to put the underemployed to work. There's a huge underemployed capacity to produce goods and services. And um, uh, we also need to remember, of course, that... Uh, um, by increasing the capacities of people to manage their own lives, we are presumably, according to market theory, increasing their ability to exercise their entrepreneurship. So if market theory has any value, uh, and it's true that people have uh, the ability, uh, ambition, to drive economic activity, then the solution to increase prosperity is surely to give those pre give those capacity to build those capacities and those life skills. Um, <clears throat> so, 
the uh, preconditions of the preconditions. Um, we do need to strengthen the public services and take some of the policy out of the political arena where it's subject to the media and political ideology and the cut and thrust of politics. Uh, we need to strengthen multidisciplinary policy analysis. We can't just give policy in any sector to one discipline. Um, economics has prevailed for too long uh, in public policy. We need to honour public service and restore security of tenure. Uh, Campbell Newman abolished security of tenure in the Queensland service because the Commonwealth abolished it. And of all of the frank and fearless values that the Commonwealth uh, looked at when it revised its Public Service Act, security of tenure was the one that went by the board. And it was underpinning all the rest, and the rest are worthless if you don't have security of tenure. Um, we need to fund um, public institutions adequately, and we have to remember that nature has the last word, and the environmental crisis will catch up with us um, and is doing so now. Finally, just to conclude and to summarise, a nation's prosperity depends critically on its public institutions. Um, these depend critically upon the education, competence and independence of the public service. And, and uh, the anti-government rhetoric by um, the Institute of Public Affairs, the Business Council of Australia, notably the Murdoch Press in three continents, and uh, by treasuries who just count the, the outgoings and not the value added, uh, these are all poisoning the source of economic activity. Thank you, Jai, and thank you, Jeff. We have about 10 minutes um, for questions. So if uh, there's roving mics, well, there's a roving mic over there. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, no, there's two. There's two, great. Thank you, and thanks for your talk this afternoon. Jeff, I've got a question for you. You said nature's going to have the last word in all this. 2017 is the year that nature can outproduce natural products more than the human race consumes it. So obviously we're in a nosedive from here. Is that being considered in any of our policies coming from government? Ooh, there's a double-barrelled answer to that. And I might use an opportunity to, uh, to respond to previous discussions that there has been no alternative to the neoliberal project there has in the sustainability literature, but uh, our policy leaders haven't been reading the sustainability literature. And in fact, there's an enormous depth of scholarship in uh, environmental science, in complexity theory, in systems theory, in uh, ecological economics even, that just hasn't transposed into the political arena or e even into the policy arena. It has quite deep roots. Uh, the, this um, inability to accommodate this. Part of it lies in the fact that most scientists are not trained in public admin and most economists and public admin graduates have no science. And in fact, in this very university where I lectured in town planning, there was a lecture theatre with about three times as many people of planning students. Now, planners are uh, planning the surface of the earth. I said, how many of you are also doing a science subject? Not one out of about 200 students was studying science. So there's an enormous disconnect between science and between policy and between economics. And until we uh, develop forums to bridge those disciplines, we're not going to get holistic policy. Uh, the, I mean, people in social science and social welfare could say the same thing um, and with some validity, but it's certainly scientists are very conscious of it. Thanks. Uh, this question is addressed to both speakers. <clears throat> Currently, our national and state governments are falling all over themselves to try to give approximately $1 billion to the Adani Corporation, which proposes to build, I guess, the largest set of coal mines anywhere in the world. 
Uh, certainly, Jeff, this policy would seem to rail against just about every dot point you had up on the screen in your talk. And I'm also assuming that uh, Jai might have some questions or issues with it. My question is, given that this particular policy on the part of both uh, the National Liberal Coalition government and the state labor government seem to be working in tandem, but seem to go against sort of any kind of knowledge that climate science has produced, that sound cost-benefit economic uh, analysis pr has produced, and I'm sure uh, also goes against uh, what the, um, indigenous knowledge systems might have to advocate about this. What do each of you feel that members of the public that are concerned about these issues can do in the face of governments, national and state, that seem to take or attach no importance either to the natural science, the social science, the history, or general public opinion? Yeah, can everyone hear me? Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's... Um, Look, it, I'll start off by saying that the ontology, the, the reason for existence in, in Aboriginal culture is that the land doesn't exist without the people and the people don't <coughs> exist without the land and that's just how simple it is. And that then, then forms a, a relationship and, and a spiritual and a connection and a spiritual connection to the earth and that's what every Aboriginal government's governance system, every Aboriginal totem, everything was, was aligned to that ontology <laughs> and, and keeping that ontology in harmony and at the moment... It, it, it's, it's as you mentioned. It's not. It's not in harmony, and um, it's from from a you know fr from my perspective. It's about. I, I think many of the things that that we both. But it's about um, valuing the knowledge systems of, of Aboriginal culture because Aboriginal culture, at, at its heart, can help and cure, or at least go to address climate change issues. But at the moment, we are sitting down the bottom of the pecking order because of this neoliberal agenda. So I'm not too sure what the answer is other than um, I hope that it's not... Um, it's not uh, we're not dealing with this issue when, when it's all burning down and crashing, which, which seems, seems to be the case at the moment. And it's about, from my perspective, it's about, well, how do we... And I think... And this is where, in my opinion, that non-Indigenous people play, because we're, we're three percent of the population so we can't we can never um, influence um, this nation to a point on our own so it's about firstly valuing our knowledge systems in order to get others to value our knowledge systems because I solely believe that our knowledge systems can help assist in in, in bringing these two things in back in harmony. Thanks my response is consistent with that if if the economic prosperity of the region depends on a coal mine, then the Queensland economy is ruined. It utterly has no future at all. And the second limb of my answer would be that I'm not sure that there is actually a good theory for generating economic activity in the regions at present with the free trade environment that we've got and with some of the other policy settings, some of, many of which we've discussed today. So there was a, study, uh, a discipline called regional studies or decentralisation studies that ran out of juice um, in the 1980s because of the neoliberal dominance. Um, but there's no theory that I can see that uh, is going to create... Sorry, that will lead policymakers to sustainable employment in the regions. Uh, no theory that's in the mainstream agenda that I can see. So I think we have real trouble... Thank you. I have a bit of historical information for Joy, which you uh, may like to comment on. At uh, a meeting, or rather at the end of a meeting, uh, Sir Garfield Barwick was talking to Sir Robert Menzies, 
and Sir Robert Menzies was vehemently opposed to holding a referendum, uh, which we all know about and what the result was. Um, and Sir Garfield said to Sir Robert, how do you feel about the first Aboriginal millionaire? And Sir, Gar Sir Garfield was puzzled when Sir Robert said, what, what do you mean? And Sir Garfield said, well, uh, if they're not subject to Australian law, they don't have to pay tax. And so changed the whole attitude to the referendum. <laughs> Roger. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, down the front. Roger. Roger, sorry. Beg your pardon, I didn't see you. I wanted to take up um, some words that were used by Jeff and suggest that they are very significant, although they're very simple. He talked about the government's role, quote, to share good fortune around. Now, that can be turned around, it seems to me. Um, and if you were a capitalist, you'd say that's what it's all about. Governments should be not sharing good fortune around, but encouraging people to make good fortunes, good not necessarily being a moral judgment. Um, but I think that one of the arguments that needs to be put is that there's nothing wrong with a government sharing good fortune around, but a lot of people would reject that. Um, and it's usually dismissed as the politics of envy. I myself have no problem with the politics of envy. I think if, if they're rich people, you can envy them. But nevertheless, I mean, that is an important philosophical position hidden by some rather simple words. Um, I, a bit hard for me to respond without getting extremely personal. Um, I buried my father a fortnight ago and in looking at his life and giving the eulogy, uh, the very first of his attributes that I admired in front of the uh, funeral was that he was a good father. And that forced me to reflect on my good fortune through having a father, first of all, who was present for the whole of my childhood, who was of good character, who paid his taxes and um, spent time with me as a, as a son. And it occurred to me that not every um, uh, male child does have those benefits. In my case, though, I'm talking about mainly non-material benefits. We were never a rich family. But uh, we just don't start with an equal chance in life. And if 20% if, uh, or 30% of the families don't have a father who's there for their sons to be uh, mentored and brought up, then who's going to step in that place? And if it's not the state, who's it going to be? We've got time for, I think, one last question, if there are any questions or comments. Okay, would you join me then in thanking um, Guy? Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim.